Porphyry believed that animals, unlike plants, although having somewhat less rational souls than humans, nevertheless still had souls. He believed that they were capable of recognizing and assessing their situation, making future plans and in a sense communicating and responding to one another and to humans. Tartos of Byblos or Thoth came from Byblos, Phoenicia, CA 2000 BC. According to the Egyptians, language is attributed to Tartos who was the father of tautology, or imitation. He invented the first written characters 2000 years BC or earlier. He played his flute to the chief deity of Byblos, the moon goddess Baal at Nikol. Tartos was called Thoth by the Greeks and Jehudi by the Egyptians. The mythology of Tartos is echoed in the god Dionysus, or in Jorth the snake priest who was the consort to the moon goddess. The snake priest was also represented by the symbol of a pillar, a wand or a caduceus. The Greeks equated Thoth with the widely traveled Hermes. According to Egyptian tradition, Osiris traveled the world with Thoth. Asclepios, alternatively known as Eshman, is responsible for carrying on the teachings of Tartos on snake priesthood. Under the protective umbrella of Hindu culture, snake charmers playing their nasal punji echo the same tradition. In the early ages of Christianity, some monks, such as Pacomius, was a Seraphic priest before he became a Christian. Similarly, Ormus is said to have been a Seraphic priest before being converted by Saint Mark. Some believe that he fused those mysteries with Christianity and establishing a school of Solomonic wisdom. It is reported then that Phoenicians and Egyptians were the first of all mankind to declare the sun and moon and stars to be gods, and to be the sole causes of both the generation and decay of the universe, and that they afterwards introduced into common life the deifications and theogonies which are matters of general notoriety. Before these, it is said, no one made any progress in the knowledge of the celestial phenomena, except the few men mentioned among the Hebrews, who with clearest mental eyes looked beyond all the visible world, and worshipped the maker and creator of the universe, marveling much at the greatness of his wisdom and power, which they represented to themselves from his works, and being persuaded that he alone was God. They naturally spake only of him as God, son from father successively receiving, and guarding this as the true, the first, and the only religion. The rest of mankind, however, having fallen away from this only true religion, and gazing in awe upon the luminaries of heaven with eyes of flesh, as mere children in mind, proclaimed them gods, and honored them with sacrifices and acts of worship, though as yet they built no temples, nor formed likenesses of mortal men with statues and carved images, but looked up to the clear sky and to heaven itself, and in their souls reached up unto the things they're seen. Not here, however, did polytheistic error stay its course for men of later generations, but driving on into an abyss of evils wrought even greater impiety than the denial of God, the Phoenicians, and then the Egyptians being the first authors of the delusion. For from them, it is said, Orpheus, son of Eagris, first brought over with him the mysteries of the Egyptians, and imparted them to the Greeks, just, in fact, as Cadmus brought to them the Phoenician mysteries together with the knowledge of letters, for the Greeks up to that time did not yet know the use of the alphabet. First, therefore, let us inquire how those of whom we are speaking have judged concerning the first creation of the world, then consider their opinions about the first and most ancient superstition found in human life, and thirdly, the opinions of the Phoenicians, fourthly, those of the Egyptians, after which, fifthly, making a distinction in the opinions of the Greeks. We will first examine their ancient and more mythical delusion, and then their more serious and, as they say, more natural philosophy concerning the gods, and after this we will travel over the account of their admired oracles, after which we will also take a survey of the serious doctrines of the noble philosophy of the Greeks. So, when these have been thoroughly discussed, we will pass over to the doctrines of the Hebrews meaning of the original and true Hebrews, and of those who afterwards received the name Jews. And after all these we will add our own doctrines as if they were a seal set upon the whole. The history of all these we must necessarily recall, that so by comparison of the doctrines which have been admired in each country the test of the truth may be exhibited, and it may become manifest to our readers from what opinions we have departed, and what that truth is which we have chosen.